Hey everyone, in this video we're going to continue on with our discussion about the DOM and about CSS selectors and talk about some of the, the methods that are available to us and some of the more complex features we can use to continue pinpointing elements on the page, particularly when we're creating automated browser tests. So I've got Google that's open here and just to recap a little bit. Uh, we're generally going to be working in our dev tools in our browser. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, view, developer, dev tools. And as I mentioned last video, uh, this is a, a tool set that's available in, in most browsers. So as you remember, uh, we've got the DOM here in this elements section, and we can use our cursor to start highlighting elements um, and pull them up so that we can see details and attributes about them that we can use to generate selectors. Um, we also were in the console last time and we were using, if you remember, this, these document methods, document.querySelector, these two um, that I like to use and uh, query selector all is the one that I like to use because it matches everything. So you can come in here and say, find all the input elements. Um, and uh, you know, start to pin this down. There are some shortcuts available in Chrome um, that just make this a little easier so you don't have to type it out every time, and that's just this dollar sign. So um, this would be um, for matching um, query selector, which will just find one, and then if I want to do query selector all, I just do two dollar signs. And these are basically just shortcuts. Um, so when I'm tinkering here in my console, I can use these just to save a little bit of time. Um, so to recap the way we're generally matching elements is by using attributes and sometimes hierarchy. Uh, last time we were targeting this, uh, this search input here by using this name attribute of Q. So let's type that in again. We use this bracket syntax um, where we say the name equals Q um, and we found it. Um, so this bracket syntax is what CSS uses to uh, specify that you're looking for this attribute that matches this value. Um, we can add on to this though and be more specific. So you can actually concatenate these together. So I can say, okay, I want um, a name that equals Q Let's see what else we could use. We could use maybe this title that equals search. So I don't necessarily have a reason to be more specific here, but if I wanted to also ensure that the title equals search, I could put that in too, right? So now it's finding the input where the name equals Q and the title equals search. Uh, and so this kind of approach can be useful if you need to start being more specific and adding um, more attributes uh, so that your browser knows exactly which element you're talking about. Um, so you can concatenate these together. Um, another thing uh, you can do is actually to remove uh, the element type if you'd like. So I've been specifying that I'm looking for an input element here, but I can actually remove that. And what that tells CSS is to just find any type of element that has these attributes. Um, it's kind of up to you when you choose to use that element type in your selector or not. Um, so one thing I like about it is that when I see this selector, you know, let's say I've built an automated test and I'm coming back to it three months later. Uh, what's nice is I see this selector is dealing with an input. So right away, I have some idea of what's going on. Um, whereas if I see this, I, I'm not so sure what element I'm targeting here. Is it an input? Is it a button? Um, so having input here adds a little bit of context. Um, one of the, I mean, not downsides, but kind of gotchas that you could run into is particularly if you're dealing with, let's say, like a button like this. Um, you can see in this case, this button is an input element, right? So maybe I match it um, with an input in front, but then the engineering team changes it to an actual button element or maybe a link element. So this changes would change from like um, input to an anchor tag or an actual button. Um, and now my selector uh, is broken. Um, so those types of changes are somewhat infrequent, but you'll hear me say this a lot throughout the series. Um, ultimately, as a tester, you're gonna wanna use your judgment about what you know, um, you know about your team and your application to make 
decision so that you've created a selector that is hopefully going to last for as long as possible, even as the application is changing. So again, you can include the element type or you can leave it off. You can concatenate these uh, selectors together. Um, and all of these attributes are available to you here. I hinted at this last video, but some of them are probably more useful than others. You know, something that looks very random like this probably isn't so sustainable. Something that um, doesn't really tell you much about the element, like max length, that's kind of vague. I probably wouldn't want to use that. So you're generally going to want to try to use semantic things that make sense to you as a human, because those are probably less likely to change and just help to add context when you're when you're coming back and looking at the selector. Um, there's uh, actually some cool things we can do with partial matching, but I'm going to cover that at the end of the video and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, there are a couple of special types of attributes that CSS has basically shortcuts for, and that is um, the class attribute and um, the ID attribute, which we don't have one here, but I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, so classes are generally associated with styling. Um, it's basically, a you know, as you can see, a kind of string that gets assigned to um, an element. We can use these uh, in our tests. And again, it's kind of a judgment call. Um, in this case, you know, in this particular example, this doesn't look um, very trustworthy. It, this looks like something that could change on a page load, or it looks like something like Google could push up a new version of their homepage and suddenly this is different. Um, but I can use this. So I just want to highlight, this also works as a normal, um, like a normal attribute here using this bracket syntax. So see, I have saying, you know, where the class equals this. Um, but there's a shortcut, and that is what I can do is take, let's say, the single class here. This space separates different class names. So this has got two different classes assigned to it. I can match by one of the classes, and I do that with a dot in front. Um, so I'm just saying, like, find the element with this class, and you can see it's finding the input. Uh, and I can do the same thing like I've done with the brackets, and I can kind of stack them together. So I could say um, that first class with the dot and the second class. So now it's saying find the element with both of these classes. So this dot is really just a shortcut um, that's a little bit handy for matching um, class names. The other one is an ID. So I'm going to switch over to just this old kind of login form I've got here that will let us demo an ID. And uh, here's our ID attribute. These are generally really useful to use in 95% of cases. Um, you can see username, it's pretty clear. It's unlikely to change. It is meant to be a unique identification for this element on the page. So it's an ideal attribute to use um, if the element has it. Not all elements will have it. And then in some edge cases, what will happen is this input will actually be kind of dynamic. So it might have this kind of stuff that your framework adds. And then, you know, when the page reloads, like these, these have changed, right? So like that can be a little bit problematic. Um, and we'll talk about that in another video. But um, generally an ID is going to be really useful. And again, it works just like a normal attribute. So I can come in here and do the bracket notation. Uh, and I found it. But I can also do this hashtag or pound symbol um, syntax. And again, this is just like CSS classes that have the dot um, IDs. You can use this, this pound symbol and it works the same way. And it's, it's just a shortcut. Um, so you'll see those a lot when CSS is used. Um, and it's just a, you could do attributes, but generally people use these just because it's a little sharper and it's a little clearer that I'm dealing with an ID or I'm dealing with classes. Um, another uh, method of targeting elements is with hierarchy. So, so far we've been talking about just matching these elements and sticking, uh, matching these attributes and sticking to um, just pinpointing the element. Um, but there may be a situation where I want to target this element based on um, its relationship with another element on the page. So for instance, I might want to say, 
um, I'm looking for the input inside of this form block. Um, and the way we do that is by using a space. So let's match the form first. Um, so we're going to do form and we'll, we'll use this role attribute, role equals search. So we'll type form, we'll use our brackets, and now we're finding this form, okay? Um, now I want to take it a step further and I want to uh, pinpoint this uh, search field inside of the form. So what I do is I just do a space and that's going to tell um, the, the browser through my CSS syntax that you should match an element inside of this form, anywhere inside of this form. So I'll do input. We can see there are actually a bunch of inputs inside of the form, probably because it's these buttons and other things. Um, so then we're still going to have to be specific enough here. So we could do, you know, name equals Q if we wanted to. Um, we might do something like uh, type equals text, I think might work, right? So um, in this case, we've still got to add some detail to the uh, element itself, but um, we can start to use this uh, structure of pinpointing an element, then adding a space, then pinpointing another element, and basically narrowing it down um, by the hierarchy of the page. Uh, so that can be um, another really useful thing to use. And there's, I won't go too far into this in this video, but there are other options like saying, um, if you have a list of three items, you know, choosing the third item in the list or choosing like the first child of this element. Um, and you can get really complex there, sometimes maybe a little more complex than you should. So for me, hierarchy is kind of like a fallback, like when there's no really good, clean way to match um, the element I'm looking for, then I'll start to think about, okay, well, where is this within the DOM and can I start to pinpoint it down uh, with parent elements? Um, the last uh, thing I wanted to talk about was um, some cool uh, partial matching features. So um, let's talk about this search button. Um, so we've, we've got a, a search button here and you can see it's got an ARIA label and a value. These ARIA attributes, by the way, are um, accessibility attributes. So they're helpful for um, disabled users who might be using the site and are using like a screen reader or um, some kind of assistive technology. But they can actually sometimes be really useful in, in browser testing because they're generally pretty semantic, meaning they're, they're clear and human readable and that can be nice for selectors. In this case, we'll use this, this value though. So um, let's match this button. So it's an input and the value equals Google search. So here's why I waited to the end of the video for this. You'll notice um, that we've got two entries showing up. And this is why I like using this query selector all or the double dollar sign, uh, because um, what's interesting here and actually tends to happen in complex applications is that there's actually two entries that matched. And you can see as I hover over the second one, that's highlighting the one on the page, but then there's this other one that matches and I, I can't even see it. Um, and if I click on it, I can come down here and it looks identical. Um, and it's inside of this, um, let's see, oh, not inside of that one. It's inside of a, this div up here with its style, um, its display is set to none. So Google is telling the page, don't show this section. So what's probably happening here is there's an actual whole duplicate of this form on the page that's hidden for one reason or another. Maybe it comes up if I do something specific. Maybe it's for mobile only. You'll see that sometimes that it shows on mobile, but then it's hidden on desktop. Um, this can be pretty common and you'll find yourself in this situation a lot where you've got this hidden copy and now you need to pin it down more specifically. Um, so we're gonna have to use hierarchy here to pin this down. Um, and I'm gonna do that by using the class name of a parent. So let's see, let's collapse this down a little bit. Um, I can use this class name here to pinpoint um, that I'm talking about a different parent div. Now, full disclosure here, these class names don't look great. Um, Google's a pretty complex site. Um, I might be thinking about other ways to do this if I was like really thinking about the best approach, but for our purposes, let's grab one of these classes Let's add it to the selector. 
and now we've pinned it down to one. So basically we've pinpointed that visible parent and then we're saying, find me the Google search button inside of that. So I pinned it down to one. Um, but now actually the point I wanted to show you is that with these attribute selectors so far, we've been matching the values exactly. So I'm looking for exactly Google search. Uh, but you can do partial matching. And what I mean by that is if you want to look for the button that just contains the word search, um, you can modify this equal sign a couple of different ways. So one is with a star. And that says, find the element with a value that contains search. It doesn't have to equal search exactly, but it has the word search in it. Um, you can do a dollar sign, which will say, find me the input that ends in the word search for its value, like this one does. Uh, and then lastly, let's clear this. You can do this caret equals, and that's gonna look for search at the beginning. But obviously our button starts with Google, not search. So that's why we're not getting a match here. But if we were to change this, just the word Google, we're gonna find it. Um, so these can be really useful if you want to just look for a certain value within the attribute. Um, I like, I, I use this, uh, this star syntax a lot. Um, and it's helpful, you may wonder why, why that's helpful. It's, it's helpful if the text might have something dynamic on it. So contrived example, but it says, if this button said, okay, Justin, let's Google search. Um, but then my test is gonna have a different name each time or something like that, or a timestamp, I may not wanna match it by the whole value or something that's specific to this one uh, scenario. I may want it to work in lots of different situations. And so I can start to get a little more broad here. Um, and again, you can, you, know, you can just continue to expand. Let's see, is this a button type? No, it's not, I think it's a submit. Um, you can start to expand and combine these things together uh, as much as you need to. Um, there is kind of a fine line, I would say, generally you're going to want to pinpoint the element uniquely, but as simply as possible. So add all of the things you need to match the element exactly, but don't add any more than that. And um, the reason I say that is because if you get too rigid and you add too much detail, then as your application website is changing, which it's bound to do, your selector is more likely to break because one of those things is going to change. Uh, and I'll show you kind of an example of what not to do, which is just funny because it's, it's what Chrome does. Um, Chrome has a feature here where I can select this search input and I can actually come in here and right click. I can go to copy and I can say copy selector. Uh, and let's see what Google gave us. It gave us this, um, which does work, but this is um, quite long and complex. Um, if you're wondering what these angle brackets are, those are, um, that's using hierarchy, but instead of a space, which will match anywhere inside the parent at any level, it's saying it has to be the next descendant directly. So basically it's, it's matching every single one of these um, parent elements as you go up and it's using all the class names and it's um, using you know an nth of child here. So it's, it's basically using all the things. And this makes for a really brittle selector because if any of these things change or your engineer just adds an extra level of divs or something, which happens a lot, this is gonna break right away. Um, so you wanna try to be as simple as possible but also create selectors that are going to stick to just targeting your element and not target the wrong thing. This challenge of creating these selectors and managing that complexity is, is really the biggest part of automated browser testing by far, is that you have to come up with these selectors, um, you have to make them manageable, understand what they're doing, and then on a rolling basis, as your application is changing, there might be maintenance involved in adjusting these selectors um, so that they work with your application or website as it's changing. I know that's a lot of complexity to cover in the video, so I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and I'm gonna follow up with another video where we're gonna dive into XPath, which is um, similar to CSS, but a little bit of a, a different um, syntax and offers some different options, uh, one in particular that's useful beyond what CSS offers.